So RSA has been around for a long time. We'll talk about the history. Uh, maybe last week, yeah, December 18, uh, this paper was published or released. And there are many news articles about it. And you see the title of the paper, RSA Key Extraction via Low Bandwidth Acoustic Cryptanalysis. So the acoustic part, it's using some sounds. And it's attacking against RSA, a public key cipher. Uh, so what we want to do is just talk a little bit about RSA, how it works, and then see how this attack works. And released last week, um, actually the guys who did it, uh, they've done similar attacks maybe 10 years ago. So it's not new, they've just only recently been able to make the attack practical. Okay, so they've done acoustic analysis, many people have done acoustic analysis, they've just uh, made it practical in the, at this stage. And the slides I have, I just quickly extracted from the paper a number of pictures and, and comments. So everything's from the authors of the paper. If there's mistakes, then they're my mistakes. We'll come back to the authors in a moment. So you may have seen tech news that mentions that uh, new attack steals email decryption um, using the sound. Okay, so many news articles last week and over the weekend uh, saying that RSA may be broken. Let's see how broken it is. So some of you have done computer science and you've do it. You're, CSS322, so you know a little bit about RSA. Some haven't seen the algorithm. You don't need to understand RSA in detail to, to understand some key parts of the attack, but let's just look at it. Uh, three, three parts in RSA, the algorithm. You generate keys, and it's a public key cipher, so you have a pair of keys, a public key and a private key. So I think every user has a pair of keys. And you usually encrypt with one key pair, one key from the pair, and decrypt using the other. And you only successfully decrypt using the other. That's the concept with public key ciphers. For it to work, you need to generate the keys correctly. You can't just choose random keys. So there's a step of key generation in RSA. And we don't care too much about it. Um, we just need to accept the fact that it works. The steps are you choose two large prime numbers, P and Q. Large, let's say 2,000 bits. Okay, so uh, 2,000, with the example we'll, we'll use, is 2,048 bits in length. That's a large number. Two prime numbers, multiply them together, you get some larger number, which is 4,096 bits in length, very large. Then select some other parameters, this E, which is related to N, and some calculate some D. And your public key becomes this N and E, and the private key N and D. So really the private value that you must keep secret is D. E and N you can tell anyone. So I generate my values. I've got my E, D, N, as well as P and Q. I tell you all my values of E and N. I keep D secret, and I also must keep P and Q secret. We'll see that they're important as well. We generate keys. Encryption is mathematically or conceptually easy. Your messages are integers. So you have a file. You need to somehow map that to a number. So you convert it to binary, treat it as an integer. Your message M, you raise to the power of E, mod by N, and you get your ciphertext. To decrypt, you do the same operation but using D instead of E. So C to the power of D mod N equals the original plain text. And some of you know that it works. That is, you can prove that if you do choose the keys this way, you'll always be able to decrypt. If you don't know that, then accept the fact that, okay, we need a private D, E and N, and we encrypt like this. Now, you have to ask questions as we go. I'm going to go through quite quickly. Uh, there's a lot to go through, uh, but stop as we go. So as an example, the values of n are usually the, the thing thought of as the key length for RSA. How long is n? And there are different values supported. Typically, nowadays, 2048 bits is considered recommended. 4096 is more secure. 
1024 is less secure. So think of it as a key length. The larger the value, the more secure against attacks. So let's say, as an example, we use the, the more secure one, 4096 bits. Then to generate keys, you choose two primes, 2048 bits each in length. Multiply them together, and you get a 4096 bit value. E is usually fixed. Everyone uses the same E value. In decimal, it's 65,537. 16 bits, it's a very small E. D is calculated based on E and the other values, and it's usually about the same length as N. So D, the secret value, is very long. Let's say 4,000 bits, 4,096 bits. It's about the same length as N. We'll care about the lengths when we look at the attack. Uh, and it's considered secure. The algorithm, the mathematics are considered secure. Breaking it requires some solving problems which are considered too hard to solve with large enough values. Now, there's a problem though. If you take your ciphertext, some random value, or some, some value which is quite long, it has to be less than n, so it may be up to 4,096 bits in long, length, and you raise it to the power of d, which is also 4,000 bits, take a large number, a very, very large number, raise it to the power of another very, very, very large number, and what do you get? A extremely large number, okay? You cannot imagine how large. All right, you mod by n. The problem, well, the problem is that implementations that do this one large number raised to the power of another large number are very slow. Okay. It works, but to implement RSA, people don't do that. They try and optimize the performance by doing a, some different operations. So this is the concept, but because this can be slow to calculate, the implementations of RSA are slightly different. There's some algorithm to implement it such that you don't have to take this c to the power of d. What you do is you do it in two steps with smaller values. Okay? Raising a large number to the power of a large number is slow. So what the implementations do is they raise a smaller value to the power of a smaller value, which is faster. And they do it twice with some different values. Now, that's, this slide tries to show that how that's done. Um, we don't care too much about the theory and why it works, but basically they split. So modular exponentiation is this step. Exponentiation is raised to the power. Mod n, we call it modular exponentiation. This is slow with when, we, when we use large numbers, so we use we split it into two steps, into two modular exponentiations. Instead of doing one large one, we do two small ones. And it still gets the same answer. And the way that they do, they get the, the, the implementations calculate some intermediate values, this dp and dq. It's a variation of our original d, but it's modded by p minus 1 and q minus 1. And some other steps in here. And the important point is that to encrypt, instead of doing c to the power of d, they first do c to the power of this dp and mod by p, and then another modular exponentiation, c to the power of dq mod by q. So we do two modular exponentiations, but using much smaller numbers, half the size in fact, half the length in bits. And it turns out that you get the same results, but it speeds up by a factor of four. So using this approach, maybe it takes one second to encrypt or decrypt. Using this approach, it takes a quarter of a second. So that's much better. And that's what implementations do. They do two smaller modular exponentiations. We don't care about how they do that at the moment. It's not going to be relevant. Uh, but note that we do two uh, exponentiations and we will refer to them later as mod p and mod q. We usually do them in order, mod p and then do mod q. Okay? So that's what RSA implementations do. Nothing wrong yet. History of RSA, where does it come from? 
three guys, the name, Revest, Shamir, and Edelman. That's the R, S, and A. Okay. 1978, they developed the algorithm. Uh, they formed a company a few years later called RSA Security. I don't think they're much involved with the company anymore. They've gone on to their own things. Uh, they're probably getting money from it. This company sells authentication tokens. You have, a, I think, some, some of you have a token, or I know URI has a, a token for generating keys. And, and they sell a library of cryptographic operations. You're all, some of you are experts in OpenSSL. That's an open source library. BSafe is a one that RSA, the company, sells. Okay? So it's just a library that increment, implements different operations. So that's the company. People from the company actually formed what became VeriSign, who create digital certificates, because RSA is connected to d digital certificates. It was acquired by a larger company uh, a few years ago. Another topic, there's some problems that people think that there are some back doors, some, some holes in the algorithms that they use, maybe paid for by NSA. But that's not this topic. Now let's go to the attack first generally and explain that this is a side channel attack. A normal attack, we think in a very simple form, you encrypt plain text using, a, say, a public key. You send the cipher text, your friend decrypts using their private key. So that's the normal operation. An attacker intercepts the cipher text, so they know C, they know your public key, it's public, they know the algorithm, E and D, their aim is to find M, and more importantly, find the private key. That's a normal attack. The attacker can intercept the cipher text, and we assume they know that. With RSA, we can do what's called a chosen plain text or a chosen ciphertext attack, where the attacker, the red one here, they choose some plain text, and they can encrypt it with the public key of the destination, because they have it, and send ciphertext chosen, or the plain text chosen, to try and support their attack. And in that case, their aim is to find the private key. They know the message. There's no need to find that. They need to find the private key. So that's a different type of attack where the attacker chooses the plaintext. Another one is the attacker forget about the plaintext. They just create a ciphertext. They don't encrypt anything, but create a ciphertext and send it to the recipient who will try and decrypt. And then that's a chosen ciphertext attack. They can choose the value of the ciphertext however they want. Why? because, and they use that in this attack, they can create the structure of the ciphertext such that it will uh, lead to some flaws in, in, in how the algorithm operates. So we'll see that this is a chosen ciphertext attack. We don't encrypt anything as the attacker, we just choose a value that will help us in the attack and send it. The recipient decrypts it. It won't successfully decrypt, but that doesn't matter. They've still done the decryption using their private key. And the next step is the side channel attack. The attacker sends some cipher text. While the normal user is decrypting, the attacker measures what their computer is doing. That's what we call a side channel. They're not just observing what happens across the network. They're also observing what's happening at the computer that decrypts. And that's, in this attack we'll cover, they listen to the sound of the computer as it's decrypting. So this is the side channel of the attacker sends some cipher text to you, the target. You decrypt that cipher text using your private key. The attacker listens to your computer as you decrypt. And from listening to the computer, if the ciphertext was structured correctly, they can start to make observations about what your private key is. And that's the basic of the attack. So you choose a ciphertext, send it to someone, listen to their computer as the CPU is working, and using some, some smarts of this attack, start to guess or work out the private key. Questions? 
Anyone hungry? <laughs> Keep eating? Yeah. It, that's the easy part so far. So yeah, ask some questions while you're having a break. Understand the side channel is listening to the computer, the CPU. private key does not decrypt what they receive, then we cannot attack. But someone, and we'll see later, that someone sends you an email that's encrypted. So you want to check what the email is, so you decrypt it. Okay? Now, it doesn't matter whether it's successful decryption or not, it's still doing the decryption. So in fact, two parts here. Choose a ciphertext, and we'll see how they choose that, and measure what the computer's doing. Listen to what the computer's doing. So they combine the, the sound, the acoustics, with the chosen ciphertext. And they get the right combination such that they wanted to discover the private key. No, the authors, uh, and I don't, I'm, I don't know much about cryptography. I teach it, but I don't do any research in the area. So, but note the, the second author, Shamir, okay? He's an S in RSA. So it's, it's not by unknowns, it's by people who know the algorithm. One of them built, designed the algorithm. So uh, in the cryptography, a lot of people, they design an algorithm and then go and find attacks against that to try and show that it's strong. And so this is uh, hopefully a, a, a quite a successful attack. Let's see. You can find the paper. Everything I've got here is just grabbed from the paper. Okay? And it's, it's about 60 pages. It's not really a paper, it's like a report. And it's quite easy to read. Okay? I mean, it, it's one of the easiest papers I've ever read. Uh, it's we well explained, and uh, even I think most of you will be able to read that, at least the introductory parts, quite easily. So what's the attack? So I'm the attacker. I need to send a specially created ciphertext to the target. You're the target, your computer. I create a ciphertext. I need to create it specially. We'll see how. I send it to you. And while you're decrypting it, you receive a ciphertext, your computer starts to decrypt it using your private key. I record the audio generated by your computer while you're decrypting it. So we're going to see how that's done. I record the audio. That is, I record the sounds from your computer. Of course, to record the sounds of a, your computer, I need some recording equipment nearby. I can't do it across the internet. Well, maybe. I need something nearby but I may be remote. Uh, what's this? Different values of Q. Q, all right, remember P and Q are the two primes that we choose at the start. Turns out if we can find the value of one of those primes, go back quickly, if we can find Q, we know N as the attacker, if I can find Q, then I can calculate P because P is just N divided by Q. That's easy. So if I know Q, I can find P. If I know the two primes, it's very, very easy to calculate D. Okay? So if you find Q, you've broken and found their private key. So in fact, this attack will focus on finding the value of Q. Sorry? Uh, yes, P or Q, correct. I mean, they're two primes. Um, Yes, so if you find one of them, you can find D. Okay.
And the attack, once we record some sounds, it turns out that different values of Q will require different operations by the CPU. And uh, when your CPU does different things, it produces different sounds. So as the attacker, by recording the sounds of your computer, I can identify those different sounds and that will allow me to determine bits of Q. Okay, and we actually do it one bit at a time. Q is, say, 2048 bits long. I listen to the sounds of the computer and it can help me determine what the one of the bits of Q was. Then I just repeat. I send you another cipher text, listen to your computer while you decrypt, and I get the next bit of Q. And I just keep you sending you cipher text. You keep decrypting them with your private key, including Q. And eventually I learn all your bits of Q, and then I can find your private key D. So that's the basics. Then I can calculate P and D. Yep. Uh, in fact, yeah, so we, we do not send the same ciphertext over and over. We send ciphertexts, but different ones, they'll be structured. Uh, we'll see how we can make that practical. Come in, whoever's there. So we'll come back to your question then. If I can find Q, we can easily calculate P and D, and we're done as the attacker, we're successful. And then we profit because many uh, systems use RSA. If we can break it, then we can do what we like as the attacker. Sounds easy. How do we do it? Go through the steps. How do we send a specially crafted ciphertext to a target? The authors of the paper give some example how to do that in practice. Let's say you, you as the target, you run an email client that decrypts emails that your friends send you. Okay, so you're you want to keep your email secure, you don't send them in plain text, you send them encrypted. So your client, when it receives emails, it decrypts them for you. And it automatically does it because it's more convenient for the user if your email is received and automatically decrypted for you. So what the attacker does is that they create some ch chosen ciphertext values and email them to the target. They send them as emails. The emails are received by the target. The software, the email client, automatically decrypts. And the attacker can repeatedly do that, maybe making them look like spam. So why would someone send you uh, thousands of emails? Come in, come in. <laughs> Why would someone send you thousands of emails? Well, they probably don't over a short period, but maybe you just, your email classifies them as spam, your email client, and just puts them into the trash automatically. So what the attacker does is they create emails that contain the ciphertext. It looks like spam. So when you your email client receives those, classifies as spam, it decrypts them to check that they are spam, and then puts them in trash. But it's still got your computer to, to decrypt those emails, to decrypt those ciphertexts. So there are practical ways, and the, the authors give some ways, some other ways, to, to make someone decrypt many ciphertexts. Okay? Emails one way. So what you need as the attacker is to make the target decrypt many ciphertexts that they receive. And it's possible. So let's say we can do that. The next thing, if we can send emails to the target and get them to decrypt them, the next thing we need to be able to is record the audio or record the sound of their computer. How do we do that? We will look at that in, in depth, how, how they go about recording the sound. So we'll come back to that one. If we can record the sound, <laughs> all right, this was step one, in fact. Just comp keep sending emails to them with the chosen ciphertext until you get the bits of Q. Calculate P and D, easy. Okay, takes the computer less than a second to do that. Once you have Q, you're done as a t an attacker. So, send many emails with your chosen ciphertext to the target. They decrypt them. 
while they're decrypting them, you record the sound that their computer is making. And how does that help? That's what we're going to spend the time looking at. Listening to a computer. What's my computer? Can anyone hear it? You can hear the air. What if we turned off the air conditioning? Could you hear my computer? Well, you, maybe you hear the fan, you hear some things. So if you sit near your computer, you'll hear, what do you hear? Hard drive? The fan? Uh, yeah, they're the main things. Music? We'll look at how music can stop this attack. It doesn't. Uh, okay, so you can, we can hear some things, but let's say we have better ears, like we have a microphone that can, is very sensitive. What can that hear? Well, turns out that I think you would know that CPUs, they change their power consumption when they do different operations. Often CPUs are idle, they do nothing. And they don't consume much power when they're idle. And then they need, need to do a calculation and they consume more power. Okay, so that's normal mode of CPUs. The circuitry that provides the power from the power supply to the CPU, as the CPU is drawing more power, that circuitry effectively vibrates. Okay? So there's the, the power supply unit provides power to the CPU. As the CPU does more operations, there's some vibrations in the electrical components that supply the power. Have I gone ahead? Yeah, that's here. So CPUs change the power. It depends upon the operations they do. If a CPU is multiplying versus adding, it consumes a different amount of power. And changing the power to the CPU leads to vibrations of the components in the power supply circuitry. Okay, so something vibrates. And you know when things vibrate, they make a sound. A very faint sound, nothing I can hear, but in fact you can hear sometimes. So, but when things vibrate, they make some sound. Acoustic emanations, they emanate some uh, acoustic noise. So, how do we do that? How do we take advantage of that? Given that, if you believe that, and it's true, they show why that's true. As an attacker, if we can listen to the sound with a microphone, and if we can distinguish what operations are being performed while decrypting, so if we know what operations the CPU is doing while it's decrypting, and if those operations depend upon a specific private key, that means if we use one private key, one D, and it leads to some operations and some sound, and then use a different private key and it leads to different operations and a different sound, then the attacker can start to learn the private key because if we know the sound, we can work backwards and know that, ah, these operations led to this sound. What led to these operations? Well, this type of key. So if, if we can distinguish and if we can listen to the sound, we can get our key. And that's the attack. But there are a lot of ifs here. How do we do that? How do we listen to the sound of your computer? You can hear the hard disk and the fan. Can you hear the CPU? And the paper gives some setup of a real experiment where they do listen to the sound of the computer. They have some microphones, uh, some good quality microphones, but nothing too expensive, that picks up different frequencies. So they have some that pick up about 20 kilohertz, up to 100 kilohertz with different sensitivities, so different qualities. And with those microphones nearby the computer, a laptop they test it with, they can distinguish the sound of the CPU activity. Okay, not the fan, not the hard disk, but they can distinguish different things that the CPU is doing. Because the CPU activity leads to vibrations and sounds sounds at different frequencies than the hard disk activity. So you think the hard disk makes sounds at one range of frequencies, the fan makes sounds at a different range of frequencies, the CPU makes sounds at a different range of frequencies again. So you can distinguish what the CPU is doing separate from the fan and the hard disk. 
and separate from MP3s of music. Okay? So if someone's playing music, they can distinguish. Can you create the same frequency at the CPU so you can stop the attack? Yes, and one of the, the preventions of this attack is to create noise that is at the same frequency of the operations from the CPU. So you need a very special purpose noise generator. And music is not. That's the problem with music. We'll see the frequencies in some examples. So first, you need some microphones. I'll show you some pictures of what they set up. OK, we'll get to that in the next few slides. How far away is the, the microphone? Uh, all right, we'll soon. All right, if we can record the sound nearby. Still, that doesn't help. We need to be able to uh, distinguish what the CPU is doing. We need to know that this sound corresponds to these operations, and this other sound corresponds to different operations. It turns out they can do that as well. They've done analysis, and they see that different CPU operations, especially in the decryption, produce different sounds. And they looked at the, the spectrogram, which is the, the, f the frequencies of the, uh, the signal, the frequency components over time. We'll see some plots. Once they do that, what they do is they create ciphertexts that trigger the different operations. Okay? So send a ciphertext that causes the decryptor to do one particular set of operations, Record the sound, because you record the sound, you know what operations were performed, and it turns out that you can make the operations dependent upon the key, upon the value of D. So the attacker sends a ciphertext, the CPU does some operations based upon that ciphertext, and those operations reveal some information about the key. And by recording the sound, we can learn that information about the key, send another ciphertext to reveal other information about the key. We'll see some details, but we'll see how far we get with time. How to record the sound. Here's a picture of what they, one test. They have three different setups. A expensive one, a cheap one, or a, uh, yeah, an expensive one, not so expensive, and easy one. The expensive one is a fixed one where they have a, a good antenna, a parabolic dish you can just see here, not too big. They have a microphone and some equipment to uh, convert it to digital. Here's the target laptop. In this case, it's about four metres away. So theirs works about four metres in this case, no further. So if the la target's there and you're four metres away with a clear view, with this dish, it works. Then they have a portable one where they have a, a smaller antenna, no dish. Portable in that they think you can carry it in a suitcase. The laptop, all this, put in a suitcase. Maybe have the antenna or the microphone pointing out. And not as obvious as having a dish sitting around within four metres. Okay? You can put the suitcase down and still record. So they do it and works in this case. The target computers, they all use a laptop. So they use several different laptops. And some are better than others for doing the attack. This one worked at a distance of one meter. Okay, so you need the suitcase one meter from the target laptop. And then mobile phone. They use a, a Galaxy Note 2, 30 centimeters away from the target computer. And they do some measurements as to where. Put it near the fan outlet. You know, most laptops have a space for the fan, the hot air to go out. Put it near there, turns out to be good. And some other locations are better than others. So 30 centimetres with a mobile phone. Mobile phones have terrible microphones compared to the other equipment. Still it works. Okay. So you leave your phone near the target computer and it automatically does the attack. Or maybe you hack their phone install some software on there so it will do the attack for you. So that's the setup. So they can record the sound. But can they distinguish the sound? 
Here's a spectrogram that they produce. What does it show? Uh, some of you will know that we can think of a signal in the time domain. You see a plot and you see the things going up and down over time, the time axis. We can convert it to the frequency domain where we see the, the peaks indicating the, the main frequency components. This combines them. And that here we have frequency from 0 up to 300 kilohertz. And here what they do, think of a, a line here. When the dot is green, it means we have a peak in the frequency magnitude. So at the frequency of whatever it is here, whatever it is, 20 kilohertz, there's a strong signal at this point. And then time increases as we go down. So across about four seconds, they do a measurement and they see the peak in this case is always about the same. But note, at this frequency, it's hard to see, but at this frequency, the signal is strong for this period. But then during this period, the signal is weak. It's not as green. Okay? The green is the signal magnitude. So there's something changing here. And then it's strong again, but maybe not as strong. So the, the greenness means the strength of the signal. The, diff the variations in the greenness is what we want to detect. Uh, and what they do in this experiment, they get their CPU to do different operations. A halt operation, two different multiplies. So this is the, think of the assembly operations on the CPU, two different multiplies, an add, access memory, and a no-op. And you can distinguish the operations. It may not look much different, but some are obvious. The halt, the sounds that the CPU that are emanating from the CPU or the equipment leading to the CPU are different from here. Okay? So you can see that the greens are different and in fact they can determine that there is a difference there. So this is just showing that by listening to the sound of the CPU, this was using their, their good equipment at, at I think one or four meters, by listening to the sounds you can identify what operations the computer is doing, what CPU operations. All right, now come to our cipher. Remember, RSA. Uh, C, we originally had C to the power of D mod N, but we split that into two, two steps. C to the power of D something mod P, and then c to the power of d q mod q. So we talk about the two modular exponentiations. One is mod p, one is mod q. So what your software does is it does the mod p first, decrypts, and then it does the mod q sequentially. So they listen to the CPU when it's doing the decryption. And here, the blue ones is doing the mod p and the red one's doing a mod Q. There's a difference. Look here, the, the magnitude is stronger at this point when they're doing the mod Q than doing the mod P. So at this point, they know whether the person is decrypting using mod P or mod Q. It doesn't give us anything about the key yet, but the attacker knows what parts of the algorithm are being used at this point in time. That's all. Questions so far? Yeah. What if um, the target computer is running other software? Uh, so, running other software, that is, you get the CPU to be doing other things at the same time. That's a, a potential uh, way to prevent the attack. It doesn't work, in mo well, at least in the cases that they tested. It doesn't work, again, because the operations that they tested, you could still distinguish. Okay? So yes, they tested what if you get some extra load, some background task to try and hide here. And they tested it and in some cases it even helps the attack because it shifts the spectrum in some cases. Uh, yeah. Uh, who's following so far? Any questions? How much time have we got? Who's leaving at one o'clock?
Okay, leave, leave whenever. Okay, we'll just go at whatever rate we can. Um, trying to go fast, but still no chance to cover it all. So, so far, the attacker, by listening, can distinguish when are you doing the mod P and when you're doing the mod Q. But still, it doesn't tell us anything about the private key. Not yet. This is just from a different laptop, a different target laptop with different frequencies. Again, uh, they can identify that it's hard to see, but the, the changes between mod P, mod Q. So they can work out what step the algorithm's in. It's maybe obvious, a little bit more obvious. Uh, well, yeah. You can see the differences. It looks very small differences, but you can calculate that it is a, an ab abrupt change from a signal, an audio signal using one range of frequencies to an audio signal with a different range of frequencies. So if we know the differences, we can detect the operations. Yeah? Question? If, if we have a different uh, CPU architecture, then the result would be the same. Uh, the diff different results. So what they've done, so yes, different equipment, different hardware produces different sounds. Okay, so your attack need, would need to be targeted to a particular uh, piece of hardware. But they've done tests with several different laptops, only laptops, and some are better than others for distinguishing the sounds, but most of them they could. Okay. So the attack's not going to work in general on every computer in the world. But if you want to attack someone's specific computer, you know that I'm presenting in this room uh, every Tuesday at 1 p.m. I, and you know my laptop. You put some listening device maybe hidden in the, the cable here. You know I'm here. I always plug my laptop in. Maybe I'm receiving emails. And then you as the attacker listen in. So it has to be targeted usually. Okay? Not general. So the, the main challenge is the things that the CPU are doing, do they depend upon the key, the private key? If they do, can we detect the different operations? So the goal from the attacker is find the private key. If the, with one private key we use one set of operations on the CPU and produce one set of sounds, and then use a different private key and pr produce a different set of operations and different sounds, then the attacker can use that to take the sounds and work back to get the key. Turns out, yes. Uh, and this is the complicated part. Everything so far is easy. The approach. You choose a cipher text as the attacker such that the decryption will require different operations depending upon the key. Okay, so I'm, I choose a ciphertext to send to you and it's chosen in such a way that when you decrypt that ciphertext, the sounds your computer will make will differ depending on the key that you have. And in this case, the target's key is in fact the value of Q. We're trying to determine Q. So we saw there was mod P, mod Q. We focus on the mod Q part. Okay. And there is reasons why mod Q is easier to attack than mod P. But we don't care about that. What it does is it looks at a single bit of Q at a time. Q is 2048 bits in length. The first bit is always 1. Uh, because if it was 0, then Q is effectively 1 bit shorter. It would be 2,040, uh, what did I say, 47 bits, okay, 2,048. So Q, the, the most significant bit is always 1. So we know that as the attacker. The most significant bit is 1. We send a ciphertext, we listen, and we try and find the next most significant bit, the next bit. If we determine it, then we move on to the next bit and the next bit and so on. So we do it uh, repeatedly. What the attacker does, they send a ciphertext, try and make the CPU make sounds that it can recognize. 
they want the decryption to sound different depending upon that bit of Q. So if you think of that one bit of Q, it's either 0 or 1. Okay? So if we target one bit. If it's 0, we want the CPU to make some sounds. If Q was 1, we want it to make different sounds. Then if we can measure the sounds, we can determine what bit Q was. Was it 0 or was it 1? Let's say bit Z Q0 produces a loud sound, Q1 produces a quiet sound from the CPU, then what I do is measure if it's loud, I assume it's bit 0 as Q. If it's uh, quiet, then I assume it's bit 1. That's the concept there. So they choose a ciphertext such that different operations will be performed and then try and determine whether that Q, that one bit of Q, is 0 or 1. And then once you've found that bit of Q, you send another ciphertext to find the next bit of Q and using the same approach. And you repeatedly do it and you keep going until you've found all 2048 bits of Q. Okay, so you need to send 2048 ciphertexts at least. Okay, sometimes it may not work. There are actually attacks to, once you have half the bits of Q, you can actually find them other ways, quite simply. Let's move on to the results, okay, because I have a few slides I'm not going to go through now. How do they do that? How do they create a ciphertext that produces the value? We'll go through that later if people ask questions. But let's, for those who have to leave, let's go skip that and assume that they can magically do it. And uh, where can we go to? Their idea, and it works, that they hope that if one particular bit of Q is some value, let's say 1, if the 2045th bit of Q, for example, is 1, then they hope the CPU has to do some set of operations like loop through many times on some value, whereas if, it's, if it was a bit 0, the CPU has to do a different set of operations, loop through but operating on a different value. If it does this, and it turns out it does, then what you do is that, uh, let's explain this. The decryption does a loop 2048 multiplication. So each loop multiplies some value. If Q is bit 1, then it may multiply a long value with the ciphertext. If it's a bit 0, it multiplies a short value with the ciphertext. Multiplying a large value with a smaller value takes different CPU effort. Okay? So their idea is that when you're doing a lot of operations, a large multiplication, the CPU makes one set of sounds. And when you're doing a different set of operations, and it's actually on a different value, it produces a different set of sounds. So what you do, if you can distinguish those sounds, you know, was it doing this or this? And if you know which one, then you know, was that bit 0 or 1? And now you've discovered the bit of Q. And how that works is the slides I just skipped. So we can come back if you have questions. And it does work. Okay? And this results show an example. The way to read it, this is, the mod, this is decrypting. And they're looking at... A, a single bit of Q. Remember Q is 2048 bits, but this is the results of decrypting using just a single bit, focus, focusing on a single bit. This is the mod P operation and then mod Q, which we care about. If the bit was zero, the audio makes this sound. If it was one, it makes this sound. Can you see the difference? Where's the difference? Look here, the, the, the green parts, it's hard to see. If the bit was 0 of Q, the mod Q operation, the ma main signal strength is at this frequency, here. 
but when the bit is 1, it's at a different frequency. It's hard to see, but this greenish line here. So depending upon the bit, different sounds are made by the computer. And that's captured here. The green plot is when it was a bit 0. The peak uh, frequency component is around 35 kilohertz. But when it was a bit 1, the peak is around 38 kilohertz. So you have an audio signal where a peak, depending upon the bit, is at a different frequency. So what you do, you measure the sound. If the frequency is around 35 kilohertz, the peak, you assume it was a bit zero that was used in Q. If it was around 38 kilohertz, you assume it was a bit one. And then you do it again, but try and get the next bit and the next bit and so on. And we're done. Because what we can do is just repeatedly do that and we get the bits of Q. Once we have the bits of Q, we can calculate P. Once we have P and Q, the two primes, we can calculate D easily. And once we have D, we have your private key. That's as fast as I can go, or as slow as I can go through that. Uh, it's still fast. Questions before we look at some of the, the practical things? Yep. How do you know when uh, the CPU is working on a certain bit? Like how do you know that now it's working on the ice? Uh, so it's the way that the, so how do you know it's working on, say, bit 2045? It's the way the ciphertext that you choose is structured. Uh, basically, the ciphertext, maybe there's a slide, is like this. The chosen ciphertext, let's say you know some of the bits of Q already, the first three bits. You know the values of Q, whatever it was, 1, 1, 0. What you do, the bit you're targeting, you set the ciphertext bit to be 0 and the rest all ones. You send that ciphertext to the target, they decrypt, and this structure causes the, the decrypting code to take different paths in a loop. So there's an if sta statement, or there's an operation that... If the qubit is zero, some operations are done by the decryptor, if it was one, a different set of operations are done. So how do you know which bit you're targeting? You create a ciphertext to focus on a particular bit. And then once you know the next bit, then you send a ciphertext that targets the 2044. Learn that, 2043, and you keep doing it until you discover all bits. Let's, all right, we can go back to that later for those that are interested. Is it realistic? Well, the conditions that they, they experimented with. The target computer, it uses uh, GNU PG, GNU Privacy Guard, for the software to decrypt. Okay, so that's a common open source implementation of RSA in there. Different than OpenSSL. Okay, you've used OpenSSL, this is a different implementation. And they used a, a recent version, and it worked for older versions. And they used a plugin in Thunderbird, the email client called Enigmail, that does automatically, automatic decryption of emails you receive. So the target person had to be using this plugin. You send them emails, and this plugin automatically decrypts those emails. And they did it for different laptops, a few specific ones, okay, to test. They expect you, it could be tailored to other hardware and other software, okay, so, and they've done a few tests on some other algorithms even, the attack works, but maybe just a little bit harder. So it's realistic. Some scenarios, they say, how do you get someone, how do you listen to someone's computer? You install some app, and they wrote an app you, that works on Android, and you put it on your phone, and you just leave your phone on your target's desk near their computer. They don't notice it. Uh, and the phone has an app that does 
the, the, the attack and maybe sends you the results of the attack, their keys. Or you somehow compromise their phone and when they leave their phone on their desk, the phone automatically does the attack. It records the audio, does the, the, the attack and sends you the results. Or you compromise the, their computer. You somehow get to their laptop and uh, install some device that can record the audio. You use bugs like in the movies, you, small devices you put near the computer. So you can get laptop locks, cables that lock your laptop, a Kensington lock, and if you can include some recording equipment inside that, so the user, the target uses that. Or a presentation, you have a podium at a conference, you, as the attacker, install something in the podium that will record the audio when the presenter puts their laptop on there. Within a few centimetres, it records and does the attack. So some practical ways to, to get the audio. Okay. It's realistic. Prevent. Shield. So that the noise doesn't come out of the laptop. Okay. Then it's harder to hear. It works, but it makes the laptop harder to manufacture. You need special devices. And how do you shield the, the fan vent on your laptop? If you cover up your fan vent, you'll probably uh, burn your laptop. That is, uh, you'll cause problems. And in fact, their attack can record the audio from the fan vent quite well. Background load, turns out doesn't work, at least in the test they used. That is, get the CPU to do other things at the same time. Uh, what does this show? It shifts the, the, the spectrum, but we still get a peak, even if the CPU is doing other things. So we can still distinguish if there's a background load on the CPU. But in the case that you, you equip, equip an added operation, it should be like something. Uh, I do Yeah, if, if you're decrypting, but know that the, the frequencies change, okay? That is, it's not always exactly here. It depends upon the hardware and what's happening. The point is to the two different bits choose, produce different peaks at different frequencies. So if you decrypted at the same time something else, may, maybe you'll get another peak here, okay? Maybe at a different frequency. So now you need to guess just between two. So yes, it makes it a little bit harder, but you just you could trial and error of those two. Listen to music. Again, music has the wrong range of frequencies to overwrite the frequencies of produced by the CPU. Around 35 kilohertz, whereas music's less than 20 in most cases. Uh, you need a special device that generates noise at that particular frequency. That will work. Okay? That's, that's how to stop it, uh, a way to stop it. But you need a device then. Okay? The, the way that's being uh, incorporated and it works that into the, the upgraded software is that before you decrypt the ciphertext, you do some operation that effectively randomizes that ciphertext. So someone sends you ciphertext, chosen ciphertext. If you decrypt it, it reveals things about your computer. When you receive that ciphertext, you actually do an operation on it and then decrypt that result. And once you get the result of the decryption, you do another inverse operation to get the real plain text back. There are ways to do that and that solves the problem. It defeats the attack effectively. So because the attack depends upon a chosen ciphertext being decrypted, if we cannot allow that chosen ciphertext, we can defeat the attack. And if you can implement this, implement this in software. You don't need special hardware to stop this attack. And that's, that's the recommended approach. So you can defeat it. And that's it. Okay. On the website, they have a nice set of pictures and, and some answers to some common questions and they have the actual paper which is not too bad to read so you can have a look uh, and ask any questions now if you want about the details.
So it works, the attack, practical. So they gave real ways to do it. They showed that it worked. Uh, but like many timing attacks, it's very specific. It's a side channel attack where we require some measurements of audio. I can't do it over the internet. You know, uh, it's not like I'm intercepting your traffic across the internet to do an attack. I need access to your computer to do it. So that's the limitation. And like many such attacks, there are relatively quick ways to defeat it. Okay. So RSA is still considered secure. But specific implementations, specific targets may be able to, using this attack, to find their, their key if they haven't set it up correctly. Okay. So if you want to target a particular person, maybe you could still use this attack. If you want to target people in general, then it's not going to work. Okay. Enough. Okay. Questions? Very quick, uh, but maybe even if you don't understand it all, it may motivate some of you to have a look into it and find out and understand some of the approaches that, it, that they use. Okay, that's the main point. Because of the block cipher, you have to decrypt the pair of the data in the center. Uh, you mean a block cipher? Because you mean decrypting a large? a large yes. uh, plain text. Yes, in the same time. Yes. Um, for, for example, you can use yep. the GPU to input the data in parallel. Uh, in theory, though, you're still using the same key, the same D. Okay? And all right, when you say in parallel, um, only in several operations. So in theory, and they only did the attack on one particular set of hardware. But in theory, you'd, it would still make noise when you decrypt. And as long as you can distinguish the set of operations being performed, now it may be harder when you're using a different hardware, but in theory, as long as you can distinguish the sounds, and as recording equipment gets better, uh, and people get more knowledge of how to create the chosen ciphertext, it may get better. So. In theory, maybe it still could work on different hardware systems, GPU, for example. Okay. Okay. Let's. I'll be hanging around. Yeah. So does the uh, fix actually just make the uh, attack relevant? Uh, the fix. So what does the fix do? The fix. Uh, yeah, uh, means that the decryptor will not decrypt the chosen ciphertext. And yes, that prevents the attack. It will not work because you will not get two different audio signatures uh, depending upon the bit of Q. So yes, it does. Uh, but this operation requires extra processing. Okay, so yes, it defeats the attack. So yeah, maybe the attack will not be used in practice against new systems. But who's upgraded to the latest version of, of this? It's released a few days ago. Many people don't upgrade for a year and so on. So, uh, I mean, in, in office environments, in companies, they have an upgrade policy to stick with the same software or they just don't know to upgrade. So yes, it defeats it, but still avenues for attack. Yeah. Yeah. So that means that the, the uh, method is not really practical in the future? Uh, the method of using time to use the audio is not theirs. It's been around for many years. People have known about it for a long time. It's really a matter of finding a practical way to implement it. So let's say, let's say they didn't release this attack. They didn't publish it. They've known about it for a year. So they've been finding the keys of people for a year already. So yes, this specific attack uh, can be stopped now, but uh, imagine a government organisation worked out this attack 10 years ago, and they've been doing it for 10 years. So that's the significance of this, that maybe someone knows about this already. 
Um, but yeah, that's with most attacks. People come up with an attack, then people come up with a smart way to defeat it. That's what a lot of cryptographic cryptography research is. Yeah. Do the interrupts or context switches affect the the system? Uh, the interrupts affect. I don't think so. I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't read anything about uh, having um, different. Uh, maybe you can have different uh, devices to cause the CPU to do different things, but I don't think so because what it measures in terms of the audio, uh, this is really a long loop, a loop with 2048 iterations. So this is time, I don't know how many milliseconds it is, but the decryptor is doing the same operation 2048 times for a reasonable period of time, so milliseconds, tens of milliseconds maybe, uh, as long as it exhibits a different audio signal than when we use a different value, then we can, even if there's some interference from other uh, operations during that, we can still distinguish. So I'd, I didn't read anything about interrupts in the paper, but I think it would still apply. Oh. Switch to the All right, you stop the CPU, but it, then it continues again later, doesn't it? I think what you would see, and I don't know if it would interrupt the CPU here, but if you did, then would you not? Maybe it would shift the frequency, okay? You'd see this part, then it will stop, and then a little bit later, then maybe at a different frequency. Turns out when they do things at different times, the frequency component changes because uh, I think because of the CPU as it gets hotter and it produces different power or power draws and produces different audio. So when you do things at different times, you don't always get the same frequency. But as long as there are different frequencies depending upon the bit, that's sufficient. So interrupting the CPU may not help. Okay, for those who want to stick around.